This is the 25th, 25th message in a series on prophecy. And we are in the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 2. And our message this morning is verses 4 and 5. Essentially, verse 4. But I'd like to read the entire seven verses of the letter to the Ephesian church. Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We are at this particular place in the book of Revelation where we find the seven letters to the seven churches. On Wednesday night, I told you that we must arrive, first of all, at some meaning to these seven letters. We cannot accept them as simply seven letters to seven real churches existing in John's time. Although there were seven churches in Asia, and undoubtedly these actual churches did exist, and undoubtedly the primary message of the Lord Jesus was to each of these churches, churches, yet there must of necessity be some greater meaning than that. First of all, there were more than seven churches in John's time. Did Christ have nothing to say to the other churches? As I reminded you on Wednesday night, what of the church of the Philippians? Did he not have something to say to them, or the church of the Romans, or the Thessalonians? Surely he has something to say to all his churches. And he has something to say to all his people. Therefore, I must conclude that these churches are representative. Seven is the number of completion. It is the number of perfection. And the seven churches represent the entire church, the entire body of Christ. Therefore, the messages to the seven churches are really seven messages of Jesus to the whole church. And you're in that church, and I'm in that church, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the message has become personal. Therefore, this is something Jesus says to us. This morning's message would be much easier for me if I could just say it pertains to the church at Ephesus. But I must say that it pertains to me. It has to do with you. And there is this warning of the Lord or this exhortation. If you have an ear to hear, then hear what the Spirit says to the church. And let me make it more personal. If you have an ear to hear, then hear what Jesus has to say to you. This is a personal message. He bears his heart to us. He bears his heart to me. He's so gracious. He starts this letter by assuring us that he is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, representative again of the whole church, assuring us of his presence and of his blessing. He assures us that he holds in his hand those who are his true ministers, his spokesmen. He assures us of his love, and then he commends us for those things which are right in our life. All criticism ought to follow some commendation. Criticism can't be all negative. 
Jesus is not all negative with his people. He doesn't start out and say, now I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. He starts out by telling us what's right. And he says, I know thy works. And again, I repeat what I told you on Wednesday night. We cannot hide from Jesus. He knows us. He knows what we are. He knows what we do. He knows what we do not do. He knows what we ought to do. He knows everything about us, what we think, what we feel, what we say, what we do. And so he begins by saying, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And he commends them. He says, I'm glad that you can't bear them which are evil. And you've tried those who said they were apostles, and you found that they were lies. I've taken note of all that you've done that's good, the way you've borne up in trial, the way that you've been patient, and for my name's sake you have labored, and you have not fainted. So all of these are good things. And he reminds the Ephesians that they're not all bad, that there have been many good things which they have done in their lives. He's glad that for his name's sake they have been true and have stood for the things that were right and honest. But then in verse 4, he tenderly says, Nevertheless, in spite of all of this, and besides all of this, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And if you really love Jesus, if you've ever loved him and ever known him, and to know him is to love him, then you cannot read this verse and take it personally without it wounding him. Thou hast left thy first love. I have this against thee. I don't think there's anything that makes a man's heart heavier than the realization that there is something between him and the one he loves. The realization that that one, his beloved, has something against him. It makes life unbearable. We can sense it. There may not be a word spoken. There may not be any discussion. But there is a gap. There is a breach. There is a coolness. There's something there that we can't get hold of, and sometimes we say what's wrong, and everybody says nothing. But there is something. And there isn't anything that hurts us and wounds us like the realization that the one we love has something against us. And it's a double wound to finally learn that that which is against us is that we have not loved that one as we should. For undoubtedly, that's the last thing we would have thought of. The first thing we think when something comes between us is, what have I failed to do? Or what did I do? And we think of our work. And I think that's why Jesus begins this letter by saying, it doesn't have anything to do with your work. It has something to do with your heart. It doesn't pertain to your hands. It has to do with your heart. There wasn't anything wrong with their works. With this exception, they were loveless works, and they're the worst kind. Loveless works are a useless kind of work. Dead duty is a very, very useless thing. Works ought to spring out of the heart, and their works were being performed because of duty and because of obligation, or because they had promised, or because they wanted to be steadfast. So the first thing he assures them is that it has nothing to do with their work, the thing that they have against them. For he commends them for their work. Their work was fine. He could find no fault with their faith. He could find no fault with their labors. He could find no fault with the way they had handled the truth and tried the false apostles and had separated themselves from the company of those who were evil. Their lives were in order. They were separated Christians. 
And they were Christians that were true to the word. They were Christians that were standing for the right. In every outward thing in their lives, they were correct. And no one would ever have known there was anything wrong in the experience of the Ephesians except Jesus. For Jesus can see into the heart, and he looks into their hearts, and he looks into the eyes and into the mind. And he says, I have somewhat against thee. And you know, I'm so thankful for the love of Jesus. We read in Ephesians 4, for instance, about speaking the truth in love. And uh, as you know, I thought for a number of years that speaking the truth in love was saying the truth in kind of a sickening, sweet way that didn't offend anybody or didn't hurt anybody's feelings. But that isn't what it means. When we speak the truth in love, it means that we love someone enough to tell them the truth. It means that we love them so much we cannot withhold the truth from them. Though that truth hurts them, though that truth wounds them, though it crushes them, our love insists that we walk in the light with them and to deal honestly with them. This is Jesus' love for us. He could have overlooked this thing and said things will be better. But instead he loves us too much to go on in kind of a platonic relationship. Just a cold, dead, meaningless fellowship. Now, if you really love your wife, or you wives really love your husband, I know how it is in our home. I can't stand that kind of existence. Of course, I'm that way in everything in life. Everything is either hot or cold to me. There doesn't seem to be any neutral gear in my life. And I can't stand that kind of relationship with my wife, where we just exist under the same roof, where we just sleep in the same bed or eat at the same table. There has to be something more than just mere association. I have to walk in the realization that there's nothing between us, that we're walking in the light, that I have nothing against her and she has nothing against me, that our hearts are clear and we're thinking as one and feeling as one and acting as one and living as one. Jesus wants that kind of fellowship and he wants it so badly that he would tell us to our face. I have somewhat against thee. It is this. Thou hast left thy first love. Now, perhaps you're not aware what your first love is or was. And so I'll tell you. Fourteen times in the Old Testament alone we are commanded to love God first supremely, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, with our bodies. This is the first and great commandment of the law, and the New Testament teaches that the law and the prophets entirely hang upon that one command. That is, that all that's in the prophecies and all that's in the law are fulfilled when that one commandment is obeyed. So the next time someone tells you to keep the law, that's the whole law. And that's what he told the rich young ruler who wanted to do something in order to be saved. Jesus said, very well, what's the law say to do? The rich young ruler says, well, it says love God. And before he could go any further, Jesus said to him, now go do that and you'll have eternal life. Because when you love the Lord as you ought to, you'll do what he wants you to do as you should. So, fourteen times in the Old Testament law we are commanded to love God first and supreme. In the New Testament we are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we are commanded and exhorted to love the brethren. But none of these things is the believer's first love. The believer's first love is for Jesus. I don't know whether you ever thought about this or not. But the first real love the believer ever knew, and the only real love that any human being will ever know, is the love of Christ. If you're a saved person, this is what happened to you when you were saved. 
I've tried for years to find some perfect description. I don't guess anything's perfect in this life. But some description nearly perfect for exactly what saving faith really is. What is saving faith? Is it believing the right doctrine? Is it accepting the correct creed? Is it being sure that our Bible knowledge is straight? Is it belonging to the right church? Is it doing the right things or keeping the right commandments or living by the right rules, walking the right way? No. Saving faith and everything that it implies and everything that's involved in it is summed up in one thing. It's simply loving Jesus. For instance, what, think of it many times, more than 90 times in the Gospel of John, we're told to believe. How can you believe without loving? And how can you love without believing? Can you love a person that you don't believe in? And can you believe in a person that you don't love? Can you trust a person that you don't love? And can you love a person without trusting? Can you really love a person without obeying them? And is there any point in really obeying anyone without loving them? And take any word you want in the New Testament that pertains to saving faith, and you will see that it's all summed up in this one great thing. It is the love of the heart for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why in the New Testament the believer is described in his relationship to Jesus as the bride of Christ. Because the love of a man for a woman is the greatest earthly love man can experience. We're told this in the very book of beginnings when marriage is established, that it is for this cause and for this cause alone that a man would leave his father and mother to cleave to that woman. So the love of a man for a woman the woman he takes for his bride surpasses the love of a man for his father and the love of a man for his mother. Now, when you think of mother's love, mother love is somehow synonymous in our thinking with the greatest love on earth. But it isn't. There's a love that surpasses that, a love that made me to leave my mother, a love that made me to leave my father. Turn my back upon my home, my family, all that I knew of life, to start out again, afresh, with a new person, a love so great that I was willing to lay down everything that I had and everything that I knew to know that love, and that was the love of my heart for my wife. And so the Holy Spirit takes that and sanctifies it and uses it in Ephesians 5 to describe our relationship to Jesus. But the love of Christ is the greatest experience of love that a man can know and the only true love he will ever know. And this is our first love. For when we are saved, what actually and literally happens is that we fall in love with Jesus. When Abraham's servant went into the far country to get a bride for Isaac, this faithful servant took some of Isaac's things and he carried them with him. And he went into this far out country and he found this woman, this Rebecca, and he began to tell her about Isaac. And he took some of Isaac's things and showed them to her, and he even took some of them and gave them to her some trinkets, some jewelry, some things. And he was so successful in his ministry that he caused Rebecca to fall in love with Isaac, sight unseen. Isaac was a long way off. She'd never seen him. She'd never heard his voice, never looked upon his face. But he'd been made so real in her heart by this faithful servant that she could see him in her mind's eye. She could love him in her heart, and so much so that she turned away from father and mother, brother and sister, 
turned her back upon her home and all that she knew of life. And grasping those few little things which were the tokens of Isaac's love, she left her home and started on a journey into a far country that ended when at last she was in the arms of her beloved Isaac. This is what happened to us when we got saved, if we got saved at all. The Holy Spirit is that faithful servant. And his business is to woo the sinner and win him to the love of Jesus. The Holy Spirit did not come into the world to scare men by the thoughts of hell into being saved. He came into this world to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But the judgment he convicts of is the judgment of Calvary, where Jesus was judged in the sinner's place. And the righteousness he convicts of is Christ at the right hand of God, our righteousness forever. And the sin he convicts of is not the things that we do and say and think and are. The sin and the single sin that he convicts the sinner of is the sin of not believing on Jesus or not loving Jesus. Now, I'm sorry I have to keep giving so many personal experiences because I'm, I'm the only guy I know anything about. That's the reason I talk about myself. But I can remember like yesterday, though it's been 20 years ago, when I first was convicted of my sins. Society convicted me of my sins. I could look around and see society and see that I didn't live like I ought to live. And I wasn't the kind of person I ought to be, very good and well. My wife convicted me of sin. She told me I ought not to do the things I did, did and be like I was. The way that I'd been raised, the standards of morality that were in my home, everything, including my own conscience, convicted me of sin. But this is not the Holy Spirit's conviction. And too many people have been convicted of sins only, then done something religious, and assumed they were Christians. The Holy Spirit convicted me later, as the Word of God was brought to play upon my heart, of the greatest sin of all, the sin of rejecting the blessed Savior who loved me so much that he died for me. He convicted me of that sin. I remember it. It was so real and so, so fresh. I could see him dying on the cross, and he died for me. And all those years I had rejected him. He loved me. The cross was the outpouring of his love. It was the evidence and the proof of his love. He went to hell in my place. Bear my judgment at the tree, and all because he loved me. Paul said, Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. And in the face of that love, such overwhelming love, something happened to me. And I was a long number of years in analyzing it. But I give you this analysis. I don't know what happened to you. But I think that all that happened to me, everything that happened to me, and out of it, all of the changes that have come in my life have flowed. One thing happened and one thing only. I fell in love with Jesus. I loved him because he first loved me. I could do nothing less. I could do nothing more. Now, I believe that you love once. Argue with that if you will. But how many times can you give your heart away? One time. Death doesn't change it. Life doesn't change it. Nothing changes it. Neither prosperity nor poverty can change it. It's for better or for worse. It's for sickness or for health. It's in whatever state. It's in whatever circumstance. It's in whatever situation we are brought into. There's one thing that survives, faith may fail, prophecies may cease, but love never fails, 
It's eternal. It continues. And we love but once when we love the Lord Jesus Christ. I find that this is the thing that I cannot get away from in the Christian life. When I get discouraged, when I'm depressed, when I'm despondent, when I'm disappointed, when I'm disillusioned, and I'm all of that many times, when I get down spiritually to where I think I'll never get up again, I would gladly forsake all, go back into the world, as the Christian world calls it, go back to Egypt if I could. If it were not for one thing, if somebody would do something about that eternal fact in my heart that I love Jesus, I would have gone back a long time ago. But I cannot get back beyond that. I am stopped there. And I hear him say, like he said to Peter that day at the seashore, Lovest thou me? And I feel like saying, My Lord, you'd have to ask me because you couldn't tell by looking at me. You'd have to ask me because you couldn't tell by watching me. I'm ashamed that you must ask me. But, Lord, in spite of all that I am and all that I've done and all that I've said and all that I've failed so miserably in, you know and I know that I love thee. And to Peter he said, Feed my sheep, tough. He just says, Well, then go on. Keep on keeping on, then. Because if that be true, you cannot go back beyond that love what had happened to Peter in that experience, we'll talk about him in a little while. He left his first love. Notice there's a world of difference between leaving your first love and losing it. No Christian loses his first love. He leaves it. It's right there where it always was. He's just strayed away from it. He's walked without the realization of it. Our first love is for Jesus. We loved him before we loved God the Father because it, be, it was because of the love of Christ that we were enabled to love God the Father. We loved him before we loved the Holy Spirit because we didn't know the Holy Spirit until he had brought us to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We loved Jesus before we loved the Bible, before we loved Christian people, or before we loved the fellowship of the saints. The first love we've ever known is the love of Christ, the only love we will ever know. And everything we love and everyone we love throughout eternity will be loved because of and in the power of the love of Christ. And I might remind you of something I'm sure you know. We are not only, uh, I am not, he is not only my first love, we are his first love. He came into this world to get a bride. He'd never had one before. We are the only bride he will ever have. Therefore, we are his first and his only love. How much did he love us? Calvary is the answer. That's why Paul prayed for the Ephesians, the very assembly that this letter is now addressed to. That I pray for you that you will know by experience the height and the depth and length and breadth of the love of Christ. We are his first love. He loved us before the foundation of the world. And before the universe was ever created, in the council halls of eternity, he saw us by his foreknowledge. He loved us and offered in the presence of his Father, to come into the world and be identified with us in our sins, that he might deliver us by his life unto himself, a spotless bride, without blemish, without any mark, without any flaw, perfect in his eyes and made perfect by his love. If you could ask Jesus this morning, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
He tell you one thing, love me. Well, that's all he desires. Now, let me talk to you a minute about marriage because of Ephesians 5, where Paul speaks of marriage, and he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Then after this long exhortation on how Christians and Christian wives and husbands ought to love each other and how to conduct themselves, he ends up by saying, This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. But the subject of that chapter is not marriage at all. It's the subject of the believer's relationship to Jesus. And so we are his bride. And what it means to leave your first love is more clearly seen by observing marriage. I'm sure you've all had this experience, maybe not. But when the man and woman are first married, their love seems to be at some kind of zenith, some kind of peak. I hear young girls, and you young girls listen to me now, foolishly saying, well, after I'm married, then I can convince my husband that he ought to do thus and so. And uh, that's uh, kind of false philosophy. Because just before you're married, when you're engaged, <laughs> he just have to do about anything you ask him. Not so apt to after you're married. <laughs> you agreed? Now, when you get married, there's that new love. They call them honeymooners. They speak of honeymooners. Now, well, they're still on their honeymoon. Love is real. They have eyes for each other. But as time goes on, something changes. The wife doesn't become any less efficient than she was. In fact, she becomes more efficient in her duties. She can cook better, hopefully. She does her housework better, hopefully. She's a better companion. She understands more what the husband likes, what he doesn't like. She knows different ways to please him that she didn't know in the beginning. The little kinks are getting ironed out in the marriage, but something's happening. There was a time when his footsteps at the door changed her whole life. She did her duties throughout the day with one thing in mind, the sound of her beloved at the door. Now she does her duties and her work, but it is not with that expected. It's out of obligation. It's out of a sense of duty. I have to do it. I need to do it. I'm supposed to do it. It's required of me. I'm obligated to do it. And he comes home and he notices that the house is clean and he notices that his dinner is on the table. He notices that his shirts are washed and ironed nice. He notices that everything's just the way he wants it. He notices that his children have been cared for. He's glad that all of these things are done. I know thy work, Jesus said. But there is something that saddens him. Something that grieves him. And it is the sense that though she has done all of these things, she has omitted the only thing he wants. She has failed to love him as she ought to. Now, I don't think we have to be on a honeymoon through... I'm going to have my 25th wedding anniversary in August. And we're still on our honeymoon, after a fashion. We're still on time. <laughs> I don't think we should, you know, be honeymooners all through married life. But I tell you wives this, and I tell you husbands this, that if you've failed to love one another as you ought to, you've failed in everything in marriage. Marriage is love. And a marriage without love is a terrible existence. A loveless marriage is a torment. Jesus wanted no servants. 
Everything, according to the Gospel of John, was created by Jesus. That includes a hundred million angels enumerated by John in the Revelation. It includes all the cherubim and the seraphim. He wanted servants, he could command them all. He said at the cross, I could call twelve legions of angels. He didn't come into this world to save men that they might be his servants. He came into this world to save sinners that they might be his bride. Before he wants workers, he wants lovers. He doesn't want you to do anything for him until you've done the first thing that he wants and the only thing that he wants, and that's loving. For I know this, if my wife loves me as I uh, as she ought, uh, she will serve me as she should, won't she? And if I love her as I ought to, I will serve her and give myself for her as I should. For out of that fountain of love flows all the service the lover will demand. And in that fountain of love is all of the enablement and all of the power to serve that we need. Love will spend itself. Greater love has no man, Jesus said, than this. A man lay down his life for his friend. What then should a man be expected to do for his wife? And what should she be expected to do for him, lest it be to give herself, lay down her own life for him? What then does Jesus want? What does he want above our works, above our labor, above our patience, above our theological correctness, above our proper walk, above our separation? Above everything that we prize in the Christian life, what does he want? One thing, I have this against thee. I want you to love me, Jesus would say, as you did at the first, as you once did. Now, Wednesday night, we're not going to go into the word remember until Wednesday night. Now, I'm going to prolong this agony on loving Jesus, because Wednesday night we're going to talk about his first command, remember from whence thou art fallen. And all of you can remember, can you not? That's what he wants of you. If you would ask him today, and I did this just as recently as last night, I just had to cry out, Lord, what is it you want of me? What is it you ask of me? What is it you want me to do? Well, I never did get any other answer. I just want you to love me like you used to. I want you to love me like you need to. For I know that all the happiness of the Christian life is when I love him as I ought to. All the joy of Jesus is mine when I love him as I should. Now, you married people, you know that when your love is not right, that Joy is not right either, and peace isn't right. Nothing's right. You know when you're sharing in one another's joy and when that joy is withheld, don't you? You know when you walk in one another's peace and when that peace is withheld. Let me tell you then that the cause of it and the root of it is this one thing. We're not loving each other as we should and as we ought to. And then in marriage, it isn't that that wife who got busy about the duties of the house doesn't love her husband anymore. I wouldn't accuse her of that, nor would I want her to accuse me when I get busy in the things of my life of not loving her. It isn't that. Nor does Jesus accuse me of not loving him. But it is that we have left that love. The wife gets busy, and soon she, in that transition, gets occupied with things. And somehow she's kind of satisfied with the things of her husband. They're filling her life, her children, possessions, home, whatever it might be, the routine. 
of life, the challenge of life. And she gets occupied with those things. And she somehow gets satisfied with it. Something's lacking on her part, too. She doesn't know what. A husband waits for one thing. These things that she possesses, they are only what has flowed out of his love. He wants her love. He wants to be supreme in her heart. It isn't that she has quit loving him. She's just not walking in the appropriation of that love, not walking in the enjoyment and the appreciation of it. And you know, one of the best things that can happen, I think, in a marriage, is every now and then, just sit down and talk about how it used to be. Because you'll find that there was something that was real and fresh and vital back there. When I stop and think how I first loved Lena, how I used to talk about her to anybody and everybody, and all she had to do was say, come, and boy, I went. I didn't always obey her as quickly when she said, go, <laughs> nor did I obey my mother-in-law as quickly when she said, go. For quite a few nights she said go several times before I went. <laughs> but let me tell you, her wish was my command. I was walking in the appreciation, the realization of one thing. I was in love. And you know, I'd climb to the stars. If it didn't rain, I'd go see her. <laughs> well, it doesn't hurt the believer to sit down and think, and that's what we're going to do Wednesday night, about how it was. <laughs> Remember from whence thou art fallen, for Christians can fall, and they do fall. They don't fall from grace. They don't fall so as to be lost. They fall from that first experience of the love of Christ, because they do just what married people do. They get occupied with the trials and the challenges and the tribulations of life. They get occupied with the things of life, and suddenly time has gone by and they wake up one morning and realize that they've grown cold toward each other. And Christians can wake up to the realization that they've grown cold towards the Lord. you believe that? And that things have distracted them. And the challenge of life has drawn them away. They didn't mean to. You know, some marriages are saved by a second honeymoon. True. By a marriage just coming to a place where it's kind of a Mexican standoff kind of a stalemate. Too many things have happened. Too many things have gotten in the way. Too much water over the dam. Both of us have been too busy. Raising children, meeting the problems of life. Marriages are sometimes saved by a second honeymoon. That takes place when the husband and the wife just take away and Get away from everybody, go off some place and sit down and fall in love all over again. That is, relive that first experience of love again, when there were just the two of them. Just the two of them. I see this what happens in a marriage. It starts out with two, and there's three, and there's four, and sometimes there's even eight or nine. Not just children. There's problems. There's things. There's a living to be made. There's a home to be built. There's a way of life to be established. There's all of these things, and the first thing you know, there's not just two anymore. There's all of this great big thing that's piled up and built up until sometimes the two lose sight of each other. This is what happens in the Christian life. When it started out, brethren, 
There was no one but me and Jesus. Nobody but you and Jesus. Remember how real it was? Just you and Jesus. You know, when I was saved, I wasn't conscious of anybody on the earth but me. I don't mean the exact moment I was saved. I mean at the time I was saved, after I was saved. I walked around like I was in a dance. I thought there wasn't anybody in the world but me. And I thought nobody knew Jesus but me. As far as I was concerned, when he died on the cross, and I still feel this way, he died for me. And had there never been another human being before me or after me, he still would have gone to that cross, and he still would have loved me, and he still would have given himself for me. And you know, I thought of him as being mine. He was my Jesus never occurred to me that he might be yours, too. All I was sure of was that he was mine. And I walked in the realization of that. I was just like a man in love. I talked about him. Wherever I had an opportunity to talk about him. To whoever would listen. And I said the things about him that every man ought to say about the one he loved. How precious he was. How wonderful he was. You know, when you're really in love, the only regret you have is that every man in the world couldn't have married your wife. <laughs> you just feel sorry that every other man has to be stuck with somebody else. You ought to feel that way, shouldn't you? That you married the most wonderful woman in the world. And if you had your way for every man, it would be for him to marry someone as wonderful as you married. What about the believer? Good land. You'll pardon my profanity. That's a little strong, I'll say, my goodness. Isn't it strange that professing Christians wander around out here in this world? And they speak in such glowing terms of everything and everybody but Jesus. I've heard people get ecstatic about the church. Oh, you ought to see what we're doing over at the church. Oh, you ought to see our new minister. You ought to see what we did last Sunday in Sunday school. The disciples came and said, Lord, you ought to see the temple buildings. And in so many words, he said, I've already seen them. <laughs> and one of these days, not one stone will be left standing upon another. We get so all fired excited about everything in this life and talk about everything in this life. Why, like during the election, some man's name is on everybody's lips talking about a man, about a man, about a man. I know Jesus longs for his people to be in love with him. Because wherever they go, they just talk Jesus, talk about him, tell people how wonderful he is and how precious he is. That's witnessing, as the religious world refers to it. Witnessing is not backing someone up against a building poking scriptural truths down their throat, or catechizing them, nor indoctrinating them, or giving them your theological views. I'll tell you what a real witness for Jesus is. It's a man or woman so in love with Jesus that he just walks around manifesting that. And every time he gets a chance, he's talking about Jesus. He's not telling them, you ought to believe us and so. He's just telling them, I know what I know. I was blind and I can see. I was dead and I'm alive. Once I had no lover, now I have a lover. His name is Jesus. Read the Song of Solomon sometime. The Old Testament picture of the love of Christ. It's been imagined, and I don't have any reason to doubt, that Solomon wrote it after his tremendous... Well... I'm not using the word I was going to use. That experience in life where he left his first love. He got interested in fast horses and bad women. I believe Solomon must have repented of that. And I think if he did, the Song of Solomon was written after that. It was when he knew that love again. He speaks through that little maiden in that Song of Solomon, and he has her going out into the streets at night, 
crying out about her beloved until folks stop her and say, tell us about your beloved. Why is he so much better than anyone else's? And she says, oh, let me tell you about him. He's ruddy and fair. Remember that? The first thing you know, she's preaching Jesus. And they're listening. And they want to see him too. And they want to know him too. And they want to love him too. Because if he's that wonderful, they need him. And they want him. And that's what convicts man. Now, if I were an unsaved man, there'd be one person I would never want to be around. That'd be somebody in love with Jesus. I could hack them religious fanatics, them church nuts. I could take all of them because I could figure out some smart answers for them. But I want to tell you, I don't know what I'd do with a man that loved Jesus. Would you? You'd either have to listen to him or stay away from him or the other. And if you listen to him long enough, you might fall in love with Jesus, too. And that'd be bad. So he'd be one man that would be poison to me. I'd want to stay away from him. If you know anybody like that, and you're not saved, you better stay away from him. Because sooner or later, the love of Jesus is going to get to you. Because it's real. That's the reason why he only wants one thing out of these people. He wants us to love him like we used to, you see? Uh Uh-huh. He thought I was going to say he wants us to love him like we ought to. And that puts a commandment out here and makes me to measure up to that commandment and find out I've fallen short. And that puts upon me the obligation of trying to measure up to that standard, which I cannot do. The standard he establishes is one we have already accomplished. It is a love we have already known, a love we have already experienced, already walked in it, already done it. He's not asking us to do something we can't do. He's asking us to do something he knows we can do. We've already done it. If this happens in my marriage, my wife doesn't say to me, now, you never did love me. The thing for you to do now is to fall in love with me. No, she just wants me to love her like I used to love her. She knows I loved her. She can't deny it, and I can't deny it. Why, to deny that I loved my wife in the beginning, I'd have to bite my tongue off. How could I do that? Take back a million words as well as a million deeds? No, my love has been too well established. And so is the believer's love. He's not asking us to do something we can't do. This is an act of the will that we can do. We're told, dear friends, that we have left our first love. And the word leave or left means to dismiss or to send away. And it infers an act of the will. And that's bad, isn't it? Jesus says, you have by an act of your will dismissed and sent away your first love. How do you do that? And would you do it deliberately? Of course you wouldn't do it deliberately. Would you do it knowingly? No, you would never do it knowingly. But you do it. How do you do it? There's only one way I can think of that you do it. Now, I can, by an act of my will, cause something to happen in the experience of my love with my wife. All I have to do is just keep on resisting her advances, resist her expression of love to me. You follow me? Simple. And sooner or later, something will happen between us. And she will come to me and say, I have someone against thee. You've left your first love. She won't say, you don't love me. She shouldn't. She knows I love her. And I know that. But she says, you've left your first love. Why don't you manifest your love to me as you once did? Then I look back and I realize that it's been my coldness my resistance to her overtures of love, 
my stubbornness and my pride that's kept love from flowing like it ought to between us. This is exactly what happens to the believer. We resist the advances of the Lord Jesus in our lives. I'm certain we do. He would speak to us, but we're too busy. He would deal with our hearts, but we say, Lord, don't I have enough on my heart without you dealing with me? He would get our attention, but we're too wrapped up in things. He would talk to us, but we can't stop long enough. I've been there. You ever feel like there was something between you and your wife? Or between you and your husband? And you felt like if you didn't get it straightened out, you were going to die. You didn't want to go on another minute, another hour that way. Well, did you ever go in and try to talk to her? Did you try to get supper? And she says, excuse me, you're in the way. She puts the pan on, and I say, well, I, I, would you mind just getting back out of the way a little bit? Well, I, I, well just we'll learn to sit down. We am trying to get supper. We do the same thing with Jesus. He wants to talk to us and say, well, Lord, um, I want to finish his book. Let me finish this book I'm reading. Uh, when are the TV programs over, if you don't mind? Uh, I did want to look through the paper. I, I have to go someplace tonight. Now, Lord, the first thing in the morning, we'll think about that. You ever do that? Yes, you have. There have been times when some promise from the Word of God, some, something from this precious book was burned upon your heart. And you knew Jesus was talking to you, didn't you? And you knew he wanted to say something to you about that. And you kept saying, oh, I'll think about it next week. I'll make a note of that. That's what I do. I'll make a note of that. And the next time I have a little time, I'll meditate on that. We resist his advances. We spurn his overtures. And the Christian who starts out in the Ephesian stage of leaving his first love, will end up in Laodicea. And his spiritual condition will be rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. And Jesus will be outside knocking, saying, Hear my voice. Open a door. You will not just be pushing him aside in the kitchen of your heart. You have him clear outside, and he'll be waiting to come in for that fellowship and that communion that he wants. It's a serious thing. Hear him when he speaks. Listen to him when he talks. When he would draw you off to himself to spend some time with him, don't deny him. Again, the song of Solomon comes to my mind and how her beloved came to her one night and appeared at the lattice, wanted to see her and to love her and to hold her. And she said, oh, it's late. Read it. It's in the fifth chapter. Oh, I, it's too late. I'm getting ready to go to bed. Come back tomorrow. I'm busy. And he slipped away, but he never come back. And because he'd never come back, she was grieved. And then she thought back and remembered that it was her who had spurned him. And she went out into the streets to look for him and to cry, Has anyone seen my beloved? Have you ever been there, Christian? You knew the Lord wanted your fellowship? He spoke to you? He said, Come apart and rest a while? He said, come, my child, and let me talk with you. And you said, I'm too busy. Come back tomorrow. It's too late at night. I'm tired. I'm all ready for bed. I'm getting ready to go someplace. I have to read the paper. I have things to do. And then later you said, now, Lord, what was it? But he doesn't answer. And that freshness of him speaking to you is gone. Maybe quite a while, you see. Now he says, 
One translator gives it this way. I have something on my heart against you. It is this. You do not love me like you once did. Isn't that a terrible thing? An awful thing? Are you an Ephesian Christian? A Wednesday night. I always like to run in serial so you'll come back. We're going to deal with this same theme again. We're going to discuss how this happens. And furthermore, we're going to discuss how we can tell whether we've left our first love or not. You may just be sitting there blandly saying, Oh, I love Jesus. But it may be that when you begin to remember from whence thou art fallen, you will repent and do your first works. The first work you ever done was love Jesus. And it's the only work you ever wanted. He can get all these labors performed by angels if he needs to. And they'll do it lots better than we can do it. But he can't get anybody to love him but his bride. And if his bride doesn't love him, there'll be no one to love him. Our angels just don't have that capacity. They don't have the capacity to love. They've never been redeemed. And they can't know anything about redeeming love. And they can't know anything about the cross of Calvary. We know about it. And it was redeeming love that bought us. It was the endless, eternal love of Jesus that sought us. And we've known it and tasted of it. And he asked one thing this morning. Do this and your, right, your life will be right with Jesus. Love him. He so said, you just command us? Yes, I command you. Love me, he says, as you once did. And if you once loved him, you can love him again. Only one thing you need to remember and then repent. For repentance is a change of mind and a change of heart and is at the same time a confession that he's right about you. But your heart is cold. But you haven't loved him as you ought. And as you can. And this morning, this moment, this second, you want to, and you're willing to. And you'll find that all the enablements you need will be there, and the love of Jesus will be just as real as it ever was. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for thy word, and thank you for reminding us of the love of Jesus. Oh, what a precious and wonderful experience to know and love him convict my heart and convict the hearts of all who belong to Jesus this morning. Enable us and work in us so that we will know again the love we first knew when we were brought by the Holy Spirit.